And uh, if you notice, we're going through the book of Jude, okay? And uh, would, would you name one of your child Judas? Mm. <laughs> I'm pretty sure right away you say, hmm, the traitor? I wouldn't name him. But in reality, Judas and Jude is the same. Okay? It's just the same. It's just that because, you know, to call somebody that was writing in the Bible a book, to call him Judas, was a little bit despicable. So they made a little change, say, okay, it's Jude, not Judas. Okay? Judas. But because Judas Iscariot, the traitor, he is the main example of an apostate. Because this is what the book is all about, about the apostates. So he is the main example. If you want to remember what an apostate is, just remember Judas Iscariot. Okay. But now, you see, by, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit inspired another Judas this Jude that we have here to expose the apostates, to expose them. And not only to expose them, but as we're going to see next week, he even tells us how to overcome the apostates, how to overcome them. So in a way, the, the name Judas is being uh, used now by Jude as something positive, okay? Because I'm pretty sure you wouldn't mind calling one of your boys Jude, but it's the same as Judas, okay? <laughs> but just uh, in a different form. So we're going to, to continue and, uh, you know, we already covered seven verses. Okay, we already covered seven verses, so we're going to continue and to cover up to verse 16. But um, because we had two weeks without going through the book, so probably you remember, how much do you remember of what we have already covered? Let me see, what percentage do you think you remember what, what we already covered in these three messages? Zero percent or 100%? 10%, 20%, 50%. All right, so for each one, it's a different percentage, okay, what we remember. So let's start looking. We're not going to read in our Bibles or our telephones, but we're going to have all the verses here so that we can um, remember some of the things that we learned. First, in the first two verses, Jude is telling us his desires. And he said, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept in Jesus Christ. Okay? And then he tells us, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Okay? So this is what he desires for all his readers. Okay? For us to experience mercy, peace, love be yours in abundance. Okay? Why? Because this is something that a, an apostate does not experience. But a true believer, yeah, he can experience that. And he is wishing us and desiring for us to experience this from God in abundance. In abundance. Okay? So it is God's will for us to experience God's mercy, God's peace, God's love in abundance. It is us that we are constantly putting the brakes on what God wants to give us, what God wants to, uh, to do in us. We're the ones that we're putting the brakes, putting the brakes, putting the brakes, because that's the spiritual battle. The spiritual battle, the purpose of the spiritual battle, when, when we do spiritual battle, is to allow God to do everything that he wants to do in our lives and through us. Because Satan wants to stop 
what God wants to do in our lives and what God wants to do through us. He wants to stop it. So that's the spiritual life. So who's going to decide what's, who's going to win? Us. We're going to decide if I'm going to go more with my feelings, my emotions, my experiences, and this and that, and put the brakes on what God wants to do in my life. It's going to be up to me. Okay? It's going to be up to me. So this is what the desire of Jude, he wants us to truly experience that. Okay? Because when we experience everything that God wants to give us, when we experience everything that God wants to do through us, it's going to be way more difficult for error to be successful in our lives. It's going to be more difficult for us to be deceived by apostates. It's going to be more difficult. But when we are hung, hungry for the things of God that we are not truly experiencing, God the way that he, that he would, would us to experience him, then it's going to be easier for us to receive, to accept, to believe heresies. Things that are not according to God. Okay? So that's why he desires that. So that's why he makes a declaration of war against apostates. He's telling you, look, we got to make war against these apostates and their false teachings, their false doctrines, because it's going to hurt you. It's going to affect you. It's going to be for the detriment of your spiritual life. And if it is for the detriment of your spiritual life, it's going to be for your emotional life, for your physical life. It's going to affect you, everything, because we are a unit. We're not separated. We're not divided. So it's going to affect us completely, 100%. So that's why he declares war. He says, dearly loved friends, I had been planning to write you some thoughts about the salvation God has given us. But now I find I must write of something else instead of urging you to strongly defend the truth that God gave once and for all to his people to keep without change through the years. So now he's telling us, I want you to put your helmet, get your sword, your breastplate, the sandals, dress up. For war, because we have an enemy that is already within our churches. It's already was already within our churches. And look, we're talking about two thousand years ago. Can you imagine now? Can you imagine now? All those false teachings that started to spread inside the church when the apostles were still here on earth ministering. And help in the churches. But can you imagine now what kind of doctrines we have all over our churches? So that's why he's calling us and he's telling us, notice here in the blue, strongly defend. Strongly defend. Do you have that attitude of strongly defending sound doctrine? Or you're just like, a, nah. It's not a big deal. Oh, let's, let's just be loving to everybody and let's not offend people. And you know what? One of the main reasons why this letter is not really preach or teach, like, for example, the letters of John. How do we know what is the title or what is... The, um, the main idea on the letters of John, first, second, and third letters of John, they call them the letters of love. Because if you notice, love, 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 love is mentioned through all the letters. Those are the letters that have the word love the most. So that's, that's what they're called, the letters of love. And, and people like to read those letters. Do you love love letters? So those are the love letters from the Bible. But then the next 
The next book, we come to Judas, and nobody likes because it's a very strong book. It's a confrontational book. So most people don't like that. They say, no, let's, let's just study John, a love letter. But not this letter. This is too strong. It's right in your face. And it's, it even sounds offensive. So when, when they were gathering the books that they were considered the, the ones that are, that are um, canonical, that are inspired by God, they had some trouble with Judas because of, the, of, of this. They said, mm, I don't know if his spirit is a loving spirit, the way he's saying things here. But in reality, it's just the other side of loving. One side, yeah, the letters of, of John is one side of love. But love has two faces, two sides of love. And here, Judas is showing us the other side of love. And that's the way that we can raise our children the best when we offer them the two kinds of love, okay? The tender love and the tough love, right? So now Judas is giving us the tough love. And he's telling us, hey, no mercy with our enemies. They want to destroy your life. They want to destroy sound doctrine. Strongly defend the truth that God gave once and for all. No changes to his people to keep without change through the years. That means that there is no way to suddenly change our position and say, oh, God changed his dealings with his church, and now he is doing a new thing among us. A thing that is not according to the scriptures. But sometimes we, we because nowadays we Politically correctness has told us, hey, don't be confrontative. Don't be offensive. You know, accept people and that's it. So, you see, nowadays we don't take it seriously, the words of strongly defend. Strongly defend. Say, does, does that mean that I'm going to enter into arguments, strongly defend what I believe? Yes, but that's what the Bible teaches. It's not me, the one that is, that is telling you. If that's what the Bible teaches, strongly defend. Strongly defend. You have to do it. You know, just lately I've been having that kind of situations in, in the radio because, you know, I'm probably the only one that preaches or teaches what what I teach here, and I have been strongly defending the faith, and you know, the looks that I get is like, mm, this is from from another planet. This guy is from another planet. But you have to strongly defend what you believe if you truly believe it, because if you don't truly believe it, then you're gonna say, oh, okay, amen, amen, amen to everything. Mm. But that's not according to God's will. For God's will is for us to strongly defend the truth that God have already given us. Okay? The sound doctrine. It says here the, re the reason. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago. So he's telling us, look, God already knew about them. And they, they are already condemned by God. Because God knows the, the, the future from the past. He knows everything. From, therefore, these are already condemned. Hmm? They are already condemned. What's written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Okay? So, we already covered that. So, now he's telling us that Damnable outcome of apostates, okay? There is an outcome for them. It says, though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those 
who did not believe, okay? So, see, that's an apostate, somebody that claims to be part of God's people, but is not really saved, is not really God's people, and is going to be opposing, opposing in reality the truth. So what happened, he's telling us, and, and, and he's reminding us, look, you know, he already said, though you already know, you know our history. You know these events really happen, okay? How the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe, see? So he's telling us, I'm already telling you, this war that I'm asking you to, to get involved in, to be engaged in this war, it's a winning war. It's a winning war. Don't be afraid. You have the truth on your side. You have God on your side. The other side, God is not with them. They are already condemned. They don't have the truth. So don't be afraid to, to expose them, to share the truth with them. Don't be afraid. <coughs> but sometimes that's our problem. We, we're just afraid. And we shouldn't be afraid because, look, it's telling us what happened with those that oppose God and oppose the truth and oppose the, the, the true teachings from God. Punishment, consequences. What happened with those? They were lacking faith. They were lacking saving faith. So don't be afraid of those that lack saving faith because if you have saving faith, God wants to use you to bring those to the knowledge of Christ. He wants to use you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid if they are Mormons, if they are Jehovah's Witnesses, if they are this, if they are that. If they don't have the sound doctrine, if they don't have the right Lord, the real Savior and Lord that you have, don't be afraid of them. They need Jesus. They're just deceived. They are, they're just deceived. They lack your faith. And the angels who did not, this is another example, who did not keep their positions of authority as angels of God, but abandoned their proper dwelling and they became, because of, of their rebellion, they became demons. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So he's telling us, don't be afraid. God is with you. God is going to give you the victory. What happened to those in the past, those apostates? Because even angels were apostates. They apostatized. So the, because of their rebellion, they were punished by God. God defeated them. And in similar way, another third example that he's giving us, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perver perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. Okay? So what was their sin? Immorality. So in a way, Judas is telling us, look, and this is the same way with these apostates. Okay? They lack saving Faith, okay, they lack saving faith, so therefore they are rebellious to the truth and they live in immorality, okay, immorality. And then comes the denunciation of apostates, okay, and this denunciation is going to give us like the elements of their behavior, their conduct. It is the same with these people, okay? You see, it is the same with these people, the same as the three previous examples that he gave us, okay? Of lacking faith, of immorality, of rebellion. He's saying it is the same with these people who have entered your group. Can you imagine? They, they are in the church, already part of the church. 
They are guided by dreams and make themselves filthy with sin. They reject God's authority and speak against angels. Wow. Okay. So now he's exposing them so that we can learn from them and that way we can know when you see this, you will know that this is false doctrine. That is not according to sound doctrine. They are guided by dreams. Okay? Isn't that very common nowadays? Oh, I had a dream and God told me in this dream this and that. I had a revelation and God told me this and that. Isn't that very common nowadays? It's so common that maybe you can be tempted to say, Oh, praise the Lord. Instead of confronting that person, say, hey, we're not supposed to follow dreams, okay? We're supposed to follow just the written word of God. The word of God is complete already. We have everything that we need. We don't need dreams. You can be deceived through dreams because you never know if the dream was the cause of the tacos. Hmm? or something else, or even Satan, you don't know. If I were to tell you the dreams that I have, and then if I try to find <laughs> meaning to those dreams, <laughs> that would be crazy. <laughs> but that's what he's saying. Hey, this is not correct. It's already here in the church. They were already experiencing that. Okay, they were already experiencing that. That so what it what it is is the beginning in the Christian church of mysticism. Okay, that it was the beginning of mysticism, of uh, trusting experiences, trusting experiences, trusting emotions, trusting you know the things that that you can. Feel, that's, that's the beginning of mysticism. And now, nowadays, and especially here in California, most of the churches are mystics. Their worship, their beliefs are more into the mysticism than into the word of God. But, you know, we don't see it as condemning. We see, like, oh, well, they're, they're just... The, a different way of worshiping it. They're just a different way of thing. But we don't see it the way that Judas is telling us that we should see it and that we should be careful. Don't let it come into your church. He's telling us, don't let it come into your church. Because it's not right. It's not according to the sound doctrine that was already given to you. You don't have to add you don't have to take away from the scriptures. Just keep it the way we gave it to you. By inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's already here. A complete revelation of God. You don't need more revelation. So this, it was the beginning, you see. Guided by dreams. And make themselves filthy with sin. Because, you see, when your system of life is based on emotions, on mysticism, on experiences, then it's very easy to follow your passions, your desires, your emotions. That's why, I don't know if you have made a study, I have done that kind of study, on the, um, from, uh, what was it like? the 1990s to our days, most of the uh, scandals in Christianity, most of the scandals, 90 something percent of the scandals were from the mystic leaders, mystic churches. Mm? The scandals, and most of the scandals is immorality, greed, mm? and they come from, from that wing of Christianity, the mystics, those that have their basis on emotions and feelings and experiences. 
So it's easier for them to even practicing sin. You see, I was reading a pastor, and I know you have heard about him, John MacArthur. He was saying that um, when he was recording, before he had his own recording studio, that he was recording in different studios for the, for the radio program, that he met pastors that would go to record drunk. Mm -hmm. Other pastor went to record with his boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And things like that. He gave several examples and he said, Things are terrible. And they are the ones that were pushing to get me out of the radio. Oh no, he's too divisive. He's too divisive because he was just preaching the word of God. He was divisive. So that, that's what happens nowadays. If you preach the word of God, you're divisive. You're a legalist, you're this. And those that are in, in that environment, those are the ones that are considered like, uh, the good ones. And here he is denouncing them. Okay? He's presenting them naked, just the way they are. Look, they are guided by dreams. So if Judas, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is condemning to be guided by dreams, should we be guided by dreams? No, we shouldn't be guided by dreams because it's already condemned in the scriptures. You know, I, as a pastor, through the years, people have come, Pastor, I had a dream, and, but it was so real. It wasn't, so help me get the meaning of this. Look, I'm not Daniel. <laughs> and I don't believe in dreams. You know, in the past, yeah, God used dreams in the past, but now we have a complete scriptures. So all God's revelation is here, okay, completely. What is the meaning of revelation? That we have everything. Even we have, we can see the future in the book of Revelation. That's the meaning of the word revelation. Is when you open a curtain, and God opened a curtain and allow us to see the future. So he revealed everything. It's complete. The Bible is complete. So, you see, and they reject God's authority and speak against the angels. Okay? So, as you can see, their attitude, it's an arrogant attitude. The, the, the kind of attitude that, look, I'm very powerful. I'm very powerful. And that's one of the things that attract people. They say, oh, he's very charismatic. He behaves with so much power. You can feel his power. Very charismatic. But that's the thing. They reject God's authority and speak against angels. Speak against angels. Now, let's, let's see the context of here about angels in verse 9. Okay, but before, let me show you the meaning of mysticism because I already mentioned it. Mysticism, okay, now in Christianity. Christian mysticism tends to elevate experience, emotions, feelings, intuition, and impressions above the written word of God. Okay, that's what mysticism when we see it in the church, when we see it in Christianity, that's what it means, okay? To elevate, to put it as superior. Emotions, feelings, intuition, impressions above the written word of God. And I have dealt with people like they said, but look, it's not according to, they have told me, but you don't understand because you have never had that experience. So, they claim that if you have that experience, now you have to believe in that. Because experience is above the written word. And I told them, I was said, look, 
I'm not saying that you didn't have that experience or that you don't have that experience, but you can have supernatural experiences that are not from God. That are not from God. You can have supernatural experiences that are not from God. You see, one of the main warnings in prophecy is that the Antichrist is going to deceive many because of his signs and wonders and miracles that he's going to be performing. And that's going to be the Antichrist. Hmm? The Antichrist. So we have to be aware and to know the truth so that we can guard ourselves against false doctrines. Okay? So that's mysticism. And it's not according to, to biblical Christianity. Okay? Mysticism mostly comes from, from Hinduism, from Buddhism. And, and that's why I have a video. If you're interested, you can ask me. Just let me know and I can send it to you. Where you can see in Hinduism the, the mystic experiences that they have exactly the same as the mystic experiences that they experience in these Christian churches. It's exactly the same mystical experiences. Exactly the same. No way. The only difference that you're going to see is that the way they are dressed. Okay? They are dressed like Hindus and the other ones dressed like Americans, but exactly the same experiences. Because that's where mysticism comes from. It's not from the Word of God. It's not from the Bible. It's not from the Apostle Paul or Peter or Judas, from none of them. On the contrary, they are, they are warning us and telling us, hey, be careful. This is not Christianity. Okay? I know it can be appealing to have that kind of experiences and feelings and all that, but it's not from God. It's not according to the Word of God. Okay? So be careful. Now, that's why he's saying, but even Michael... One of the mightiest of the angels, when he was arguing with Satan about Moses' body, did not dare challenge Satan with insults, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. See? So he's telling us, like the previous verse, when he's speaking about angels, when he says, it is the same with these people who have entered your group. They are guided by dreams and make themselves filthy with sin. They reject God's authority and speak against the angels. So he's, in reference, he's speaking about the fallen angels. Fallen angels. Just because they're fallen, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't respect them as more powerful than us. Because they are more powerful than us. See, the only reason why we're not overcome by demons and possessed by demons is just because of the restraining power of God upon them. Because of God's will, God's mercy. But if God, if God was not in control, we would all be possessed by demons. Because they are more powerful than us. So Judas is telling us, hey, even if they are fallen, you have to respect them. You have to respect them. You cannot just, you know, very arrogantly saying, hey, I'm going to step all over Satan and his demons. Like nowadays, they have services of stepping over all kinds of demons and Satan. And they have all the congregation marching, stepping all over demons. Now the demon of this and the demon of that. And everybody's marching, stepping all over them and doing this and doing that. Now it's, it's a practice. And, and you know, a, a person that I know, he has sound doctrine. When he visited a church like that, he told me, Pastor, I know that that's not biblical. But it felt good. You know, I, you know, I felt good. I know it's, a, it's an emotion. Don't you feel good having a, a, an a, a adulterous experience or fornicate? Everything that you can feel good about that, but it's not according to God's will. So you see that the, the problem is that 
because you had a good experience, you, it felt good. Now you put it above the scriptures. So now experience and feelings and emotions and impressions, they are above the written word of God. And they even tell you, it's because, you see, the word, just the word like that dry word kills, but the spirit gives life. So this is about the spirit. And that's why their emphasis is, is mostly about, oh, this is the work of the Holy Spirit, and this is the spirit, and this is the fire from the spirit, and this is... And, 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 you know, I, I was listening to a, a song, you know, in the radio station, fuego y fuego, and the person is asking for fuego, for fire, for fire. When in the Bible, the meaning of fire is judgment. <laughs> and when they're asking for more fire and more fire and more fire, in reality, biblically, they're asking for more judgment, but they see it as as having more experiences, experiences from God. Hmm? To experience the Holy Spirit moving among us. So it's a lack of doctrine, hmm? a lack of under, true understanding of the meaning of the word of God, the words, okay? And, and that's what they, it says here, but even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels, hmm? The mightiest of the angels, when he was arguing with Satan about Moses' body, did not dare challenge Satan with insults. Simply said, the Lord rebuke you. So you see, once you go out of the word of God and you get into mysticism, you become arrogant. You become arrogant. And now you think that, that you're powerful because even they teach that you are a little God, that you are a little God. That's where mysticism has taken them to that teaching, that you are a little God. So therefore, you know, you become arrogant because, you know, I'm a little God. I have the same power of God because all I need is to believe, to have faith and name it and claim it and things are going to happen because I have faith in the Lord. And so... You become like a little God. They, that's how they teach it. And, they, and, they, and they, don't, they don't say, no, no, we don't believe that we're little gods. No, they teach it. Yeah, we're little gods. And that's why they behave that way. But here he's telling us, no, don't get that attitude. So you see why Judas is telling us about, hey, defend sound doctrine. Because what we believe is going to determine what we feel, and what we feel determines what we do. So if you believe mysticism to be proper for your Christian experience, then it's going to affect your feelings, what you're going to allow mm, of your experiences, and it's going to affect your behavior. And most likely, you're going to become arrogant, thinking, yeah, I'm a little God. I have the power. No, I have the power. The Holy Spirit is me. And they use biblical verses distorted because they don't know doctrine. What is doctrine? You see, the, one of the characteristics of false groups, false doctrines, false teaching is that they take a verse out of the context of the scriptures, and they make a doctrine out of a verse. When the word doctrine means that, for example, the doctrine of God, how do we come up with the correct doctrine of God? By learning what the Bible teaches about God from Genesis to Revelation. It's got to be consistent with the whole Bible, the whole Bible, that's doctrine. And doctrine is the final statement of that study. When you study everything from Genesis to Revelation about God, you see the whole study is theology and doctrine is the final statement. God exists in three persons, God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's 
the doctrinal statement of the theological study of Genesis to Revelation about learning about the doctrine of God. And every doctrine is the same thing. It's got to be according to what the Bible teaches, the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, not just one verse. Some groups say, oh, here this verse says, now baptism saves. So salvation is through baptism. I want you to read the whole Bible and so you can understand the context of this passage. No, it, it says here, baptism saves. So baptism saves. Wow. No doctrine. So now he's telling us, but even Michael, one of the mightiest angels, he was humble, he knew. He was not God. God is the only one that can rebuke. I don't have the power to rebuke Satan. I don't have the power. And now and that's what you see in, in those mystical churches. I order you to come out. Because according to, to their services, they can have uh, that kind of experiences almost in every service. And they have made investigations, and most of that, it's fake. And they have acknowledged that it's fake, but the reason is, they say, we just want to uh, stimulate the faith of people present in our meetings so that they can believe. Hmm. With fake experiences, you want to create saving faith? That's not. So, so they do things like that. So we can, we can become arrogant. Now, let me clarify this. I'm not saying that every person that some way or another practice things like this, that they are apostates. No. Because I have met many that are sincere and that I consider them my brothers in Christ that are truly saved. But because they don't know doctrine, they have been deceived. And now they believe some erroneous doctrines. So it makes them behave arrogant. For example, it is part of that mysticism and that arrogance to say when I bless you. I don't know if you have seen that, those pastors that pray, and I bless this church, and I bless this pastor, and I bless. You're not the source of blessings. God is the source of blessings. He said, Lord, I pray that you may bless this. Always to the Lord. He is the source of blessings. He is the source of power. I declare you healed. I declare prosperity in your life. I declare this, and I declare, you declare that? Are you God? Yeah, according to the doctrine, yeah. But I have found those that say, no, I'm not a little God. But they have believed that kind of a doctrine, and it makes them arrogant to feel that kind of power that I can declare this to be done. I declare this to happen. I declare this to go away. But it's not according to the word of God. We have to always rely on God and his will. Even Jesus, when he prayed, he said, Lord, if it is possible to, to pass this cup from me, but, you know, not my will, but your will be done. Even Jesus, he didn't say, I declare myself without sin, so I'm declaring myself that I'm not going to the cross. He didn't have that kind of arrogance. He was humble to God's will. He was humble. Even the Lord is our example. So that's what Judas is telling us. Be careful. Be careful because those teachings are going to hurt you spiritually, emotionally, in your practices, in your experiences. Everything is going to hurt you. And, and once a person gets into that mysticism is very difficult to come out of that mysticism because it is like an addiction. 
Once you have that type of experiences, what they do is they, they're looking for a stronger one and a greater one and a stronger one and a greater one. That's why one of the characteristics of those that practice that kind of mysticism, they tend to go from church to church, from church to church, because now to the gates of heaven are open now in this other church and things, new things are happening there, so now we're going to go over to that church. And now we're going to go over to this church because new things God is revealing, God is doing a new work, a new pouring of the Holy Spirit is over here, it's over there, and so they're following new experience. It's like the drug addict. Oh, my friend has a better weed, I'm going to go over there, and I know over there, in El Paso they're selling better weed, so now I'm going to go there, and, and, and you're just going because you want something stronger, something better, something that can really give you another lift in your emotional experience. So it is very dangerous. It is very dangerous. So you have to be very careful and, and get the, the example of Michael, even Michael, one of the mightiest of the angels. Do you think you are mightier than Michael? None of us. None of us is more powerful than Michael. And Michael didn't dare, he says here, insult Satan and his demons, he didn't insult them. He just left it to the Lord. God, you're the all-powerful. You are the one that has the power. You know your will. So the Lord rebuke you. Okay? So we have to be very careful. And like I was telling you, yeah, I believe that, that somebody can be a true believer and still deceive, be deceived by those apostates that are teaching that and promoting that, these false doctrines, and they can start practic practicing that. I declare my brother heal. I declare prosperity. I, declare... I have seen it in Facebook. I have seen it in Facebook. I say, oh, come on, you're into that. Hmm. Please, God. Please, don't do that. No. Arrogant. I will, I've been using that word. What do you mean? Making claims or presuming to have superior importance, rights, and powers than others. That's what arrogance means, to have arrogance. Making claims or presuming to believe that you have superior importance, rights, and powers than others. That's completely opposite to be humble. Completely, completely opposite to be humble. And what is it that God wants us to be? Arrogant or humble? Okay, and, and that's what Judas is telling us. That apostates behave arrogantly, while true believers that are submitted to God and His Word, we're going to be humble. We're going to be humble, not arrogant. But nowadays, it's more attractive to people an arrogant leader than a humble leader. Nowadays, they consider that person with more power, with more charisma, with new things. Of course, once you get into mysticism, ooh, you can come up with so much new things. That's why they call it the new age, because they are constantly coming up with new things, new things, new things. I remember when I first became a Christian that I studied about new age, the definition of new age in those days to now, it's, whew, they have added so much things through the years because they're always looking for something new, a new experience, a new teaching, a new experience, a new teaching, and, and that, that is happening among Christians in churches. They're constantly 
coming up with new things, new things, new things, new things. And people like it. Oh, yeah, this is, this is good. This is a blessing. No, it's not a blessing, according to, to Judas, to Jude. To be careful, because that's arrogance. Okay? So when, when we have that attitude that we believe that I am a little God, where does that come from? Believing that you have the power to bless. You have the power to curse. You have the power to heal. You have the power. To, where do you think that comes from? Do you think it comes from God? No. Remember at the beginning? Hmm? Look, it says, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Now, who's speaking here? Satan. Those are the words of Satan. Those are the words of Satan and that he, he was convincing Eve to disobey God. And he's telling, look, God, you know, he's not giving you everything that you can have. He's not giving you everything. And, and that's what they're telling you. Oh, don't go to those dead churches. You're not getting everything that God wants to give you. Come over here, and you're going to get everything that God wants to give you. To the point that you're going to be a little God. But that's what Satan, that's the lie of Satan, that you're going to be a little God. That you're going to have God's power. That you're going to have that authority. Can you imagine if all of us true believers had the authority to be binding Satan? I bind you, Satan, and I'm sending you to the uh, <coughs> to a pit of hell. And do you think if we were so we don't need God anymore? We don't need God anymore. Forget about God. Now we just take over. We can do whatever we want. We can even order Jesus to come back. Yeah, because we have all the authority. We have all the power. But that's a lie from Satan. That's not from God. And that's what Judas is telling us. To be very careful. Okay. Now, verse 10, it says, But this man mock and curse at anything they do not understand, and like animals, they do whatever they feel like, thereby running, ruining their souls. So, what is their guiding rule? What is in blue? They do whatever they feel. They are guided by feelings. See? Not by the word of God. Oh, they, they rebel against the word of God. They say, no, it's the letter kills. The letter kills. I'm not going to follow the letter. The letter kills. That's how they interpret it. Wrongly. But, so they do whatever they feel like, because supposedly this is what God is leading me to do. This is what God is empowering me to do. Yeah, but is it according to God's word? You know, I don't want to get into that, because if you want to get into doctrine, you want to make divisions, and that's how they respond. Like if you're trying to make divisions, that happened. One pastor called the radio station and said, Hey, you should stop that preacher. He is preaching doctrine and he's going to divide us. And I, I talk to him and say, when you talk in the radio, when you do your presentation, there, you, you are also preaching doctrine, but your own doctrine. Okay? Your own doctrine. That's what you're doing. And I'm not stopping you. Hmm? 
Let the people decide if they want to believe your doctrine or my doctrine. So, but these men mock and curse at anything they do not understand. You see, they do not, they do not understand. They don't understand the truth, the word of God, so they mock the word of God. They mock the word of God. You see, and, and, and one pastor, they already took that video, okay, from, from uh, YouTube. It's not there. This pastor, you know, his main foundation for the church was mysticism, emotion, everything, to the point that he got the Bible and he said, look, we are the body of Christ and the Holy Spirit is moving us and guiding us and leading us. So why do we need this book? And he threw it away. He threw it away. He threw it away. But it is real. He was just being honest. He was just being honest. Others, they won't do that because they know that you will be in shock and say, no, I, I'm not staying in this church anymore. Maybe not. That was not the reaction of the people in that church because he had already been working, working, working in their minds. They, you know what, what was the reaction of the church? They stood up and praised the Lord. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. And they started making a big noise of praise because he threw the Bible. Can you imagine doing that? So that's what Jude is telling us. Be careful, be careful, because they're going to do whatever they feel like, because they are already in that system of mysticism. So they're going to do whatever they feel like. So in reality, they are living by feelings. Are we supposed to live by feelings? No. The Bible warned us, the heart is the most deceitful thing there is and desperately wicked. No one can really know how bad it is. So that's why don't follow your heart, don't follow your feelings, your emotions, your impressions. Follow the word of God, the written word of God. That can be trusted, but don't trust yourself, okay? Don't trust yourself. Those who trust themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. And wisdom, it comes from the word of God. When we know the truth and we apply it in our lives, that's wisdom. So he's telling us, be careful. Be careful. So Jude, in verse 11, tell, tell, tells us, woe to them. And that word, woe, it means like the only thing that they can expect is Hell, that's the meaning of the word, whoa, it's a condemnation, whoa, they have taken the way of Cain, they have rushed for profiting to Balaam's error, they have been destroyed in chorus rebellion, you see, he's teaching us about the Old Testament and telling us their the, the elements of their sin. For example, Cain, he said, they have taken the way of Cain. Okay, what is the way of Cain? Hmm? What is the way of Cain? Rebellion against God's way of salvation. Remember? Abel, follow God's instructions on how to worship him as a person with faith in God. shed blood, but Cain said, no, no, I can do whatever I want the way I want it, and, you know, God has to accept my offerings because, you know, this is what I do, and their own way, not God's way, his own way. We want to do it his own way. So rebellion against the way of salvation. So he's telling us, look, these apostates, they are rebellious to God's ways, to the way of salvation, to the workings of God, to God's will. They are rebellious, like Cain. See? And then it tells us, 
They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. Okay? Greedy for material gain. God already told them, Baal, Baal, don't go with that king. A king wanted him to pay him money so he can curse Israel. God told him, no, Israel is my son. Don't curse Israel. So he said, oh, how can I do it? They're offering me a lot of money. So he found a way to disobey God and to get money to bring harm to Israel. And he was successful. He was successful. So he's telling, look, these people are greedy for money. They do whatever, whatever is necessary to get money. That's why you will see them with their own private jets, with their mansions, with like, like this pastor. He was saying it in, 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 on TV in his message. Look, look at my shoes. He said, look at my shoes. How much? How much do you think I pay for them? $10,000. Why? Because they made them just for me. Just for me. The, these shoes, he said, they are the only ones in the world. The only. So can you imagine? $10,000? How long does it take us to raise $10,000 here just for my shoes? Would you be willing to do that just to get shoes for me? <laughs> no, I read, instead of shoes, I'd rather have hair than shoes. <laughs> so then, then I would accept that the, your efforts and your sacrifice of $10,000, but not for shoes. <laughs> so it's telling us. And then it says here, about woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error, and they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Korah, rebellion against authority. So they are rebellions, rebellious against authority. Like Korah, he, he organized a rebellion against Moses. He says, oh, no, no, you're, you're not the only one that speak from God. And we even doubt that you, that you really sp truly speak from God. You are deceiving us. You took us out of Egypt, and now we're suffering here. And, and he got many people on his side to the point that Moses had to tell them, look, okay, let's, let's settle this. Those who are with me come over this side. And those that are with Korah stay over there. So many people came to the side of Moses, but many stay with Korah, rebellious. Then the Bible says that the earth opened up and fire came and <laughs> consumed them. Consumed them. So this is what Judas is telling us, Jude. Look, they are going to be judged. God. Hmm? They are going to be judged by God. But don't follow them. Don't follow their teaching. Okay? Don't follow them. And next week, we don't have time, we're going to be looking at how Judas compares the apostates with elements of nature. Okay? You can keep reading in your house how he compares them. Now, this, this second part, this other part, is poetic. But sometimes, you see, when we think about a poem, we think something uh, nice, right? Mm. Oh, a poem, romantic. This poem is hard to hear. It's terrible, this poem that he is using to describe okay, the apostates and their, the elements of their behavior and beliefs. Okay? So now, do you see why they don't like to preach about this book? Mm -hmm. Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your word, and we thank you for the truth that we know it's only in your word. It's not in us. We cannot come up with new revelations. We don't want to trust in experiences we just want to trust in your word, Lord. 
Your word is perfect. Your word is everything that we need. So help us to truly get into your word and to obey your word. And we know that we're going to be protected and we're going to be fine. So we thank you and we ask it in Jesus' name and for his honor and glory. Amen.